Good morning, everyone. Great to see all of you that we just saw a few minutes ago again. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our very first content session of the uh, uh, program on think tank communications. Uh, the reason that we framed the topic of think tank communications is twofold. One, communication is such a vital uh, aspect to advocacy and Washington DC being able to share your thoughts and perspectives on why a topic is important and why your stance on a topic uh, is one worth advocating for in a broader sense. And think tanks as a type of organization are a very key DC institution as well, driving much of the research and policy opinion that, uh, that, that drives what happens in DC. And, and, and one cannot leave a, a DC flying without understanding what a think tank is and their, their role and so how they communicate uh, it's an interesting topic that has evolved a lot in recent years and also gives some actionable communications insight into how to take what they do in their communications and even apply it to your own advocacy. So glad to have the session. I'm glad to have a moderator for the session from our very own FIU. Uh, Aline Izquierdo currently chairs our Department of Communications at FIU. So she'll be moderating the session. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her to make sure that we all know a little bit about um, our panel and hear directly from the panel. Awesome. Thank you, Eric, and thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. You know, we're so fortunate that despite the global situation that we find ourselves in right now, that we may not be able to physically gather, but we can gather through technology. And I think that more and more Zoom is becoming a second home to many of us. So I appreciate very much that everybody has been able to log on and join us so that we can really um, glean some insights from true experts on this concept of the think tank, think tank communications um, aspect of the communications industry. So I'm just going to, you know, kind of dive right in, introduce our panelists, and then kind of we'll go through some questions, and then we'll open it up for questions from you all as we, um, after we've set the stage a little bit. So joining us today, we've got Lauren Booth. She leads the digital communications efforts at the Wilson Center here in DC. She's worked with nonprofits for more than 25 years. She's very um, involved with FIU as well. John Schwartz is the CEO and founder of Soapbox, a communication agency that helps lead policy, research, and advocacy organizations to communicate their ideas effectively. Uh, Courtney Tolney, who is a senior program director and lead for Results for Development Institute, a nonprofit organization designed to unlock solutions and different development challenges throughout the world. And Paul Franz was able to join us as well. He is the Andreas C. Dracopoulos Chair in Innovation and Creativity and the Director of Technology in the Ideas Lab at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And they use creative and digital tools to communicate policy solutions for the world's foreign policy and security challenges. So a, a, a great set of folks who are joining us here today to really provide you all with insights, with their experiences, with their expertise, and, and with their view on this um, rather not unique, but specific topic. I mean, we don't, we don't tend to dive into think tanks too much necessarily. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to do so. And so as a way to maybe set that stage, I will ask, um, and however you all wanna go, if you wanna go Lauren, Courtney, John, and Paul, uh, if you wouldn't mind, maybe provide us all with what your interpretation and your definition of a think tank is, and how is it that you ended up working with these rather unique organizations? So Lauren, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll go. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Um, and I've really enjoyed my partnership with FIU. Um, it's been uh, really beneficial for me. So thanks for, for inviting me here today. Um, so some of you may know about the Wilson Center. I'll give you a brief introduction and, and how we define ourselves, how we um, define our mission. Um, we are created in 1968 um, through an act of Congress um, to be what's called a living memorial to our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson. Um, and we, instead of having kind of a statue, another 
you know, statue on the mall. Um, we wanted to be a living memorial and we were created as such to live out the mission of Woodrow Wilson. Um, he was our only president with a PhD. He began as um, a scholar um, and then got into uh, public policy and, and politics. But he felt very strongly that the policymaker and the scholar should really talk to one another. Um, that you know each could learn a lot from another from one another and <clears throat> so the way we try to live out that mission is through a variety of ways um, one of what I like to say our main products are our uh, public events we have many public events a day and there we're trying to provide kind of a, a safe space for civil discourse we're trying to bring in a lot of different perspectives and we're trying to bring in those, those audiences of public policymakers with those who are studying these global challenges in the field. And the whole, you know, the end game, the, the mission is that hopefully better policy will emerge if people are more informed about the consequences of their public policy decisions, if they're hearing a variety of perspectives, um, hopefully that's gonna make a better a better republic, a better citizenry. Um, we're hoping that you know that people are more informed. Um, another, of course, kind of foundation of the Wilson Center, because we are created by an act of Congress and part of our funding is from a congressional appropriation. It's in our charter that we are strictly nonpartisan, um, and that is you know a very key aspect of who we are. Um, you know, we're hoping that. You know, we're allowing, again, a variety of perspectives. Um, we're not pushing for any particular policy outcome. We're just hoping that better policy emerges when people are better informed and they're considering all perspectives. Um, we, another kind of key part of the center is, you know, our full name is the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And the way that kind of lives out is every year we have a number of scholars that come through the center some are through a competition um, some are, are chosen as you know it being experts in their field and because we're constantly having new fellows come in there's always an influx of new ideas new perspectives a lot of our fellows are from um, you know around the world so we're bringing in kind of that outside um, regional perspective. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an overview of the center and, and just some, some aspects about, you know, how we're trying to contribute, contribute to the world. Awesome. Courtney, do you want to? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, great to talk to you today. And, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me to be part of this exciting session. Um, so the, the first thing that's probably worth noting about Results for Development, which is the organization that I work with, is that we are actually not a think tank. Um, we started about 12 years ago and we were incubated at a pretty well-known think tank, the Brookings Institution. Um, we were a program that really started to focus on global development issues. And over the first few years on working on this program within Brookings, um, our founder, who's former vice president of World Bank, you recognize that the type of work that we were doing, especially at that time, you know, sat at the nexus of what I think a lot of traditional think tanks do, but also what a lot of implementers do, uh, more kind of practitioners in the nonprofit development space. So we ended up kind of spinning off and our mission is to support and strengthen local change agents in low and middle income countries um, to strengthen health, education and nutrition systems. So that's actually, I think, where a lot of our work in terms of think tanks ends up entering is that mission of lo lo sorry, supporting local change agents. Um, we work with a lot of different people and organizations and institutions, but one of, I think, the strongest potential local change agents that we work with in Africa and Asia and Latin America is uh, a group of organizations that either consider themselves think tanks um, or uh, kind of consider themselves policy advocacy organizations. And we work with both of those types of groups. Um, we really see a, a huge and catalytic role of organizations that are based in the countries where they're working with really strong, high quality researchers 
that are um, generating and then communicating research that's very policy driven and can really help guide the discussion on what's going on in say healthcare in Ghana or education systems in Indonesia. And I think that's um, certainly more true now than it's ever been in the middle of the global pandemic. You know, we recognize that um, a lot of the work that uh, Global North-based researchers have done for many years will certainly continue and certainly play a really, really important role moving forward. But more and more of the research and then more and more of the communications and sort of policy influence and guidance is really going to need to come from organizations, uh, think tanks and other organizations that are based in countries. So a lot of our work is kind of supporting through coaching, capacity building, research support, things like that to think tanks that are based in the global south. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there in terms of an intro. Awesome, thank you. John, how about you? Hi everyone, um, glad to be here. Um, as you can probably hear, I, I'm, I'm the odd person out here. Um, I'm coming to you from the UK, um, so it, I'm having a cup of tea as we speak, uh, as you would expect. Um, and you, your, your question was about think tanks. What are think tanks? So what? Um, I'll, I'll I'll try and answer that first, and then I'll and then I'll relate it to my own experience if if I can. So my my view about think tanks is that what we're trying to do as think tanks is we're trying to use uh, research, evidence, social science methods, um, ideas, uh, and the discourse that surrounds those um, to make social progress happen. Uh, and when I say social progress, I mean making the world a more prosperous. Uh, peaceful, um, healthier uh, at the moment place, all of those, all of those kind of good things. Um, I used to work in a, a classic think tank. I used to work in the Institute of Public Policy Research, which is a sort of centre-left think tank here in the UK. Uh, when Tony Blair was the Prime Minister, we were his favourite think tank. So we were sort of the equivalent of, uh, under Tony Blair, we're the equivalent of the Centre for American Progress was under, under President Obama. So we were sort of, you know, it was, it was the kind of classic thing. We were producing research papers. Uh, the research papers would be presented to officials within the government. Um, we would invite the minister to speak at an um, at a, at a event about the, about the research. Uh, the minister would come in and, and, and present at the event. He would be so impressed by the research that the researcher would be given a job working as a special advisor to the minister. Uh, a couple of years after that, the minister would be fired uh, and then the special advisor would come back to work at IPPR again. That was the kind of classic kind of think tank model. And my kind of, you know, uh, uh, my, my job there um, was to put together publications, both editorially and design wise, and to work on the website there. Uh, and what happened was that I used to get think tank communication started to change um, and talking to wider audiences beyond just those few special advisors and those few ministers in central government became, became very much more important. And that meant that the communications channels became much more important. And what that meant for me personally is that um, a lot of other think tanks started to ask me to do work for them as well. And in the end, I was doing more work for uh, other think tanks than I was doing for the one that I was supposed to be working for. And I didn't have any kind of life anymore. So I set up as a freelancer and I set up Soapbox um, to, to, to be providing those kind of communication services to, to other think tanks. Um, and to cut a long story short, what happened was that this, um, the change continued to happen in think tanks. They were trying to talk to wider audiences. And at the same time, of course, we were trying to talk across many, many more different channels. So when I was at IPPR, mainstream media, getting in newspapers was terribly important. And during the time that I was at IPPR, you know, 24 hour TV news took off. So that became terribly important. Um, but now social media is much more important. Digital media is much more important to think tanks. So as we've kind of grown as a company, so our expertise in those areas has, has grown as well. And I think just to sort of, you know, finally kind of just to close off on, on this, um, it is difficult to say what a think tank is. Um, um, and a lot of the organizations that we work with um, wouldn't describe themselves as think tanks, but typically they're doing think tanky things, by which I mean they're doing research and they're trying to turn research into public policy. 
Um, so we would work with a lot of a lot of different organisations, which are, um, I would say, think tank adjacent, or are sometimes doing think tank things. Many charities will sometimes be doing a think tanky type thing, but that might not be their main business. Even universities now, I think, increasingly, especially probably actually less so in the US than elsewhere, actually. But in, in, you know, if you if you go elsewhere in the world, the the people doing the job of think tanks are frequently university researchers um, rather than you know, uh, set up as independent organizations. So there are lots of, so think tanks can mean lots of things and it doesn't always mean the things that we, that we think it does. Thank you, that was very helpful. Paul, how about you? Yeah, hey everybody, it's good to be here. This is probably one of the largest Zoom meetings I've been in so far, it's 50 people in here, it's really cool. Um, so I, actually, John, I don't think you're the most odd man out. I also play quite a different role. I'm not quite in policy, but I do work at CSIS and, and in the sense that I am focused almost entirely on the communications and technology angles. Um, and for CSIS's part, you know, we're, we were founded in 1962, height of the Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis is happening. Uh, and CSIS is very much a bipartisan institution. Uh, it is focused on promoting American and Western values as a force for good in the world. Um, and for us, you know, we don't distinguish between, you know, we're briefing both sides of the aisle. And as long as we are, you know, coming up with ideas that are based in actual facts and evidence, not necessarily politicization, you know, that's, that's what we do. And we're mostly focused on international security, diplomacy, resource security and things like that. But for my part, uh, I, I came from journalism. I used to be a journalist many years ago. And I came into CSIS as a uh, multimedia producer. And when I first came in in 2012, think tanks were really in the same boat as newspapers were in 2007 in the sense that the digital change and transformation was coming. They didn't have the expertise necessarily internally to understand how to handle that or how to staff it. Uh, and really, you know, in the past decade, we've seen a shift, a massive shift uh, among many organizations in terms of, like ours, in terms of what our output is. You know, we've moved away from just the PDF or the 100 or 200 page report that nobody ever reads or does anything with. And so that's where I really came in with CSIS is like leading that transformation internally and culturally and being able to say, okay, if we're going to have an internal department like mine that's focused on digital communications, how do we structure it? And so a lot of people thought, well, maybe we should structure it like a traditional newsroom. And I said, no, no, no. What we really should do is think of it as a digital, internal digital creative agency and bring in people who aren't just journalists or writers or anything like that, but bring in folks who have technical skills. Uh, so really fun example I always like to bring in is, uh, in 2015, I hired somebody who was a medical illustrator. And why would I hire something like somebody like that for Think Tank? Well, that person knew how to do 3D modeling, which turned out to be extremely useful for uh, creating visualizations of military equipment. And for our department, you know, it, it is it runs the gamut from people who are audio producers, video producers, animators, developers, designers. Uh, people who work in publications, they are all sitting in the same room. And there is no distinction between them bureaucratically or administratively. We all work on the same team, it's cross-disciplinary, and our job uh, for CSIS is to take that traditional research that our researchers have been doing for decades and are very good at doing, but making sure that's being distributed across wide channels, not just print reports and PDFs. So we're doing podcasts, we're doing videos, we're doing motion graphic explainers, uh, campaign websites, microsites, data visualizations, uh, maps, anything that's digital, we're, we're doing it. Awesome, thank you so much. So the next question actually segues nicely, especially with some of the comments that John and, and Paul were just referencing. When, and I find myself doing this a lot, so I'm aging myself, I get it. When I'm in classrooms um, with with our students, and prior to uh, coming back to FIU, uh, I oversaw communication departments at different organizations. So we had uh, a kind of wide swath of of employees, some of whom were on the younger um, side of the, of the of the map there. And I would I would talk to them. I would talk uh, talk to our students about 
the evolution of communication and I and I walk them through the days of yore before social media when we didn't have email when we had to fax a press release and you know eyes wide open and everybody scratches their heads and wonder how could that possibly have ever worked and so my question to you all is you know what have you seen from an evolutionary standpoint not just within the think tank realm but communications industry as a whole i mean we've touched on it right the social media aspect the, the digitization and how we tell stories and communicate important information through different channels so how have you seen that evolve in your personal um, and professional world if we want to kind of start back up we can go back through and i just I, the way that i see you all i see lauren courtney john and paul so it, it kind of helps keep me in line there so if we want to kind of bump back to lauren that would be great sure um well i'm going to talk about just the last seven weeks <laughs> because things have really changed just over you know this this time of uh covid 19. um you know at the wilson center as i mentioned earlier the the public event is a, a core part of what we do and that again is to educate the public and to bring you know the right people in the room to have a fruitful dialogue and hopefully you know exchange of ideas and um on down the road and at the wilson center we have you know a few defined spaces you know we've got the fourth floor conference room the fifth floor and we've got our big auditorium which holds 120 people or so and in the in the past you know over the course of my time at the center it was always you know we got to fill the room and of course we want the right people in the room we want we don't want just retirees who are coming to get a you know a cup of coffee for free you know, we want people who are really engaged and, and are actually out in the field, you know, um, you know, influencers, if you will, you know, actual members of Congress or their staffs or um, people who are working for, you know, in the field of, of public policy. But, you know, the goal used to be, okay, let's, you know, send those invitations out early and let's, let's fill the room so that, you know, when we have a webcast, the room looks filled, right? Well, now we're physically not there. So we're, our, our invitations are no longer driven to trying to, to get people who are locally in DC to physically come. It's about getting eyes on, on in our Zoom meetings. Um, and so our whole perspective has changed, but what's, what has resulted is our live viewership has gone up by 20% over the past seven weeks. Um, and we're bringing in, of course, people, I mean, we've always, had a heavy emphasis on live webcasting you know we do probably i don't know um at least two a day so that's always been we've been very fortunate to have a really great av team and a great facility and streaming and we've always been strong in that but the whole shift has changed that's our that's everything now um but it, our again you know we're, we have a bigger impact at the end of the day more people are engaging with us than ever before. Um, and so I think this is going to fundamentally change how we operate going forward. Um, I think the reliance on having people physically come is just gonna go away because we see we can have more impact focusing more on, on you know, video conferencing. Um, it's, been, it's been interesting. Yeah, so I mean, maybe jumping off of, of um, Lauren's point, so, you know, I, we've definitely seen a huge evolution in think tank communication and policy engagement. And I think some of that has been kind of unsurprising and some of it's been a little bit more unexpected. Um, so, um, you know, on the unsurprising side, I mean, social media is, is huge and it's definitely the priority of a lot of think tanks at this point. Um, I cannot count on two hands the number of conversations that I had with executive directors of think tanks in you know, Sub-Saharan Africa or in Southeast Asia 10 years ago who were like, I'll never go on Twitter. It's not a reliable source of information. You know, it's, it hurts my reputation because it makes us sound like we're really informal. And you know, uh, now following all of those individuals on Twitter. So I think a lot of organizations um, you know, have recognized that, that social media, um, 
Twitter, um, WhatsApp, which I realize is kind of in different places, plays different roles. But the truth is, in, in a lot of Africa and Southeast Asia in particular, it's also a communication source. It's not just kind of two-way, you know, connecting with people. So, I mean, those are some of the expected changes. I think unexpected things that are really encouraging. Um, we're seeing a lot of think tanks that we work with in low and middle income countries doing a lot more communications and engagement as networks, either within a country or regional or global. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that so much is going on on social media right now that there's just so much noise that it's much harder to be heard. So, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of organizations, um, especially think tanks and policy research organizations, were um, had maybe a little bit of ego. Um, and I think we can all relate to this. It's like, well, this is my organization. This is my reputation. We need to have our name on everything. And we're kind of going at this solo because we want to get our research and our name out into the world. I think what, what we're seeing with a lot of organizations that we work with is that they're realizing that their name is no longer enough to cut through all of the noise of all of the information that's getting out there. And so we're seeing a lot more organizations that, you know, wouldn't have joined like a coalition like UHC, Universal Health Coverage 2030, or some of these other, you know, big uh, global advocacy pushes that, that think tanks say, you know, there's a role for us in there now. And then I think the final thing I'll say is that think tanks that, especially again in low and middle income countries, think tanks that are good at their communications and engagement also understand where they should not be making changes. So um, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but you know, in, in a lot of countries in Africa, a large majority of the population still gets most of their information from community radio. It's a very traditional source of communications and engagement. And while a lot of think tanks, their kind of primary audience is policymakers and government institutions, um, they're still trying to get their message out to the people. And so, you know, ensuring that they're not totally transitioning over to technology that a lot of people are not, you know, using regularly, but instead saying, okay, let's also kind of ensure that we're using the more traditional sources in a way that, you know, is getting to the audiences we want to. So I think those are some of the changes that we've seen, both expected and unexpected, but also some of the things that have stayed the same. And, and again, I think especially in the kind of new world that we're all living in are, are probably gonna continue to stay the same a bit. Thank you. John, how about you? Um, so first of all, I just wanna sort of start off by pointing everyone in the direction of a couple of resources about policy communications, which you can um, see a lot of these debates, the, the sort of the, the things we're talking about here unfolding and read more about. The first one is uh, a blog called On Think Tanks, which is onthinktanks.org. And the second one is a network called Wonkcoms, wonkcoms.net, um, where the, um, you, can, you can read some blogs and, and, and join in some events. In fact, there's a Wonkcoms event happening uh, tomorrow, um, hosted by uh, the German Council on Foreign Relations on uh, how um, communicating with government has ch had to change um, uh, during the COVID crisis. So you can actually join join that if uh, if any participants want to. I wrote a thing for on think tanks in 2016 called the Permanent Revolution in Think Tank Communications. Um, and even though it's now four years old, I think a lot of the things um, which I said in it sort of still still sort of ring true. Um, in that the in in the time in the last decade, or certainly since Soapbox has been around. We've been seeing a, a revolution in, 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 in think tank comms, which is driven by the increasing channels that we need to communicate across, but the, also the increasing audiences that we want to communicate with. Um, so it's, you know, many of the audiences that we want to communicate with, a research report um, is completely inappropriate um, to communicate with, the, with them. Um, in some ways, it always was. Um, interestingly, no one has ever read research reports from beginning to end. I say this as someone who um, has a studio that about a thousand research reports go through every year. Um, no one reads them. They, people don't read them like books. The idea that, you're, that people read research reports um, and like from cover to cover like a book has always been wrong. 
Um, that doesn't mean that, that you shouldn't do research reports because you're reporting on important research, but it means what it does mean is that you need to take the material that's in those research reports and you need to make it more accessible to the people who can put it to use and who can use it to make progress, progress happen. Now that involves doing a lot of the things which Paul does, um, so brilliantly at CSIS, um, and they've been real pioneers in doing that. We do very similar things with, with think tank content, often for, for, for smaller think tanks, but it also means the infrastructure that surrounds those things has had to change and has to become more efficient. So for example, um, branding has become a much more important thing for think tanks. When I was at IPPR, um, I think I said at the beginning, and um, we wanted to do the IPPR brand, what happened was the director stood behind my Mac um, for 15 minutes and we said should the logo be orange or should it be pink um, should it be in a sans serif typeface or should it be in a serif typeface uh, and that was how branding was done mm -hmm. in those days branding is very very much more sophisticated now because it has to re reach across many many more channels but also think tanks now are starting to take brand strategy properly seriously which is not something which you know when we started off would be would have been even conceivable. And then you move on from branding to um, all of the things that go behind branding, the templates, the, the you know, ways of doing data visualization that are distinct to that particular think tank so that when they are submit, transmitted on social media or in other channels, people start to make the, make the associations of that think tank with, with those kind of things. So that's a piece of infrastructure that goes behind the communications there but also the way that think tanks do websites now is incredibly much 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 more complicated uh, th than it was and the sort of things that Lauren's talking about like being able to host events but also not just host events but understand who's coming to those events which events they've come to before what they go and do after the events on your website you know how you can contact them and then target them is is increasingly important so I think that the sort of the, the next thing that think tanks really had to get to grips with and some are doing getting scripts a bit more, I think, in the US than elsewhere is really using uh, marketing of their content uh, in much better ways to, to reach those audiences. It used to be, again, many years ago, if we wanted to reach, you know, people, people say that think tanks are trying to reach a more public audience. Think tanks have always tried to reach a public audience. But in the good old days of, of think tanks, what we used to do to reach a public audience is we used to do it through the mainstream media. And because there wasn't social media or social media wasn't so popular in those days, that was a good way of reaching a mass audience. Now people don't get their news via newspapers or 24-hour news stations so much anymore, though they are still very, very important for think tank communications, but they don't get it so much. So if, you don't, if you're not on social media or if you're not producing content which can cut through on social media, you're, there's a whole swathe of the population that you're going to miss and therefore you're not going to be meeting your mission as a think tank, which is to reach those people, make sure those people are informed and are making informed political decisions when they, when they come to do so. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, I think one of the things I tell people when I try to explain how CSIS has adapted to this, uh, this change in communications is to think about what communications and what the medium looked like before say 2005 or 2006 it didn't change it, it, it was fairly static i mean you had you know a printed book or a report but generally speaking the contours of a report didn't really change like it didn't you know a report was a report you know a tv spot was a tv spot uh you know a radio show was a radio show it didn't really change all that much but then once you started introducing the internet and those contours just dissolved because they're constantly changing, they're constantly shifting. And stuff that we were producing 10 years ago is not at all like some of the stuff that we're producing now. I mean, think about it. You know, in 2010, we just started getting smartphones. And only right by the like mid-decade, it was really becoming more popular to read your news on the subway or however you were commuting. Uh, and then all of a sudden we needed, we had this whole thing with responsive design and had to design things for mobile first and so on and so forth. But we weren't doing that 10 years ago. And now, you know, going forward, this stuff is going to constantly keep changing. The, 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 the mediums are not static anymore. They constantly adapt to the new technologies, new platforms, you know, social media. Like we didn't have uh, Instagram 10 years ago. Right. And now it's, very popular. We, we post stories on Instagram. We didn't have Snapchat 10 years ago. I mean, we sometimes post stories on Snapchat, though it's not where our audience is. But nonetheless, like, how do we know 
that the platforms that we use now and the way that we use them will be used in the same way in the next few months or the next year. What other new platforms are gonna be emerging and how do we quickly adapt and adjust to those? Because for all we know, big swaths of our audience are going to migrate to these, like to new ones and or to old ones that uh, recalibrate themselves. So for us, I mean, I think, I, I think the thing that is most important when thinking about think tank communications is that you need to have a staff or at least a capacity to rapidly adapt and not think that you're going to be building a staff that's going to know the exact same thing and apply that to the next 20 or 30 years out. Because what's going to be, I, I can't predict what's going to happen in a year right now in terms of technology and how we communicate, much less 10 years into the future. And so it's very important, at least with our staff, is that we hire people who know how to think about these challenges and problems and how to adapt to them, not people who just necessarily know, oh, I know this one programming language and this is all I know how to do. Uh, I don't want to learn anything else. You know, you want people in a communications uh, department to be able to be very readily adaptable. They know how to learn and they're willing to learn new things. And that willingness carries over to uh, you know, a, a drive to jump to new opportunities, new platforms, new emerging forms of media. Thank you. And, and, and maybe kind of piggybacking off of that, um, Paul, and for everybody, obviously, you are not where you are now by accident. There, there has been a career trajectory that has gotten you to where you are right now. And before we open up for questions for, for our students who have joined us, uh, I'm, I'm curious if there is something in particular that you wish someone would have shared with you in terms of career advice, or you really should consider this as you were starting off in your career. Lauren, you wanna pick that up? Sure. Um... The way, I, I guess I'll start with how I got to where I am and kind of the path I took. <clears throat> um, I started out in uh, communications, but just by chance. A friend of mine uh, worked for a nonprofit. They needed some extra help. So I, you know, I was in uh, grad school at the time studying international politics. I've, you know, I've always had a, an interest in foreign policy. So that was, you know, concrete. But the way I got into comms was just because my friend needed help at a nonprofit. But when I got there, I was able to dabble in a lot of different things. I did media relations. I did um, editing. I, I um, you know, I kind of bounced around. And at, that was in the mid-90s. And the internet was just going commercial at that time. Um, and I'll never forget, my boss came to me and said, hey, uh, can you learn how to some HTML, HTML and, and launch a website for us. You think you could do that? And I'm like, yeah, all right, sure, I'll, I'll give, give that a try. So I literally got a textbook on HTML. I learned it and I launched the first website. Um, this is for the American Association of University Women. Um, so I, I became webmaster. That was the term back then. Um, and so that's how I got my start. When I got my, my master's degree in international affairs, I decided, you know what, I, I want to travel. And, and this is the wind up to the pitch. My, my career advice is, um, you know, if you all are, are interested in the world we live in, get out in the world. Um, you know, I, I got my degree at that time and I knew, you know, I, I was not gonna have a moment where I didn't, you know, eventually I figured I'd buy a house and settle down. I figured this is my moment to see the world. So I traveled for about six months um, with a friend throughout Southeast Asia. And uh, I feel like the life I lived during those six months was worth two years back at home. You know, the amount of experience you get, um, it's just, it was, it was mind blowing. Um, you, and so my, I guess my advice is, this isn't exactly career advice, but it's, it's life advice. Um, and particularly if you are interested in, in the world, if you want to get into foreign policy, international affairs, learn about the world we live in by getting out in, in it. Um, you know, you're going to have a whole new perspective if you're meeting people from other countries and seeing the way they live. Um, 
And if you're not able to travel, you know, at least get your news sources from, from foreign sources, you know, try to get a variety of news sources um, and learn how other people from other countries think. How, how, what do they think about us? How do they approach problems? Um, so that, that's kind of a winding way of saying, um, you know, my advice is, you know, while you're young and you're not tied down, get out into the world and see it. Yeah, so uh, plus one to Lauren, um, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, my career was kind of an interesting series of, of mistakes that end up, I think, getting me to where I am, um, which is true for a lot of people, I think. Um, I, I actually started out as a researcher and, you know, planning to become an academic. Um, I was working on a PhD in economics and my entire career path was, I'm gonna be a professor, tenure track, that's the plan. And I think one of the things that I learned really early, um, luckily in, in that time was um, in particular from doing international research field work, was that you know, a lot of times the push in research and academia is to become an expert in something and, and have that one thing that you are the one that everyone goes to on. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing, except what it can do is it can foster this sense of rigidity that you're not open to the fact that the world is changing around you and that your expertise and your understanding of that world needs to change with it. And I think, you know, if, if we haven't realized that before now, I think the last two months has really made that crystal clear. So I guess, you know, in terms of the kind of tagline career advice I would have, you know, a lot of people tell you, find your passion. I would say find the thing that makes you question things. Um, if you find that topic or that theme or that area that every time that you start working on it, you say, you know what, I really want to be clued into how the world is changing around me and how that's changing that thing that I care about, whether it be communications, global health, um, influencing policy, whatever it might be, that's going to serve you so well in your career because what it's going to mean is that you're not going to become rigid and stale. You're going to see what's happening around you and constantly be saying, okay, what is, how do I take this new information and translate it into making the work that I do better? And I, you know, in looking at colleagues of mine who have been incredibly successful in their careers, I think that's been a constant that, that I've seen throughout. John? Um, so I, I really agree strongly with what Paul was saying about how you don't know what the future, you know, holds, um, especially in, in, in the field of, of think tank communications. I mean, uh, I, and one example of that um, at the moment is that we're doing an awful lot of work around structured content. The structured content is important for SEO and always has been. But it's very important for voice um, search as well. So one of the things we're thinking about a lot when we design websites for think tanks now is what, not, not what does the web page look like, but what written information is going to be returned when someone asks Alexa a policy question. So that's really, that's really important. So we don't know what, so we, we don't know what the future holds. And the other thing I think is um, that, that really resonated was what Lauren was saying about you have to have a sort of, you know, you have to have a can do attitude. So you have to teach yourself how to do sort of HTML or whatever. Um, I'm completely self-taught as a designer. My degree is in philosophy and politics. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, public policy issues always, always, always have been. Um, but I got into design because I had to, um, because we, you know, I worked for, a, uh, I worked for a, a bookshop. We decided to start a political publishing company um, and someone had to design the books. So I, and we didn't have any money. So I said, I'll do, I'll do that. Uh, and my whole career has kind of really gone gone from there. And I think the sort of, I guess the overriding thing I would say to people is you don't, you don't know what opportunity looks like and it never looks quite the way that you think it's going to. So don't turn down things that are good opportunities to work with good people because they don't seem like they're profitable enough or they're on too tight a time scale or they're, you know, or it's not the right time to do it. If, it's, if, it, if it feels like a good thing to do and it's got good people and it feels like it's going to move things forward, you should just do it. Um, so that's what I, that's, that's, I, I guess, you know, in as much as I, I mean, you said that none of you have a career by accident. I have a career completely by accident. Um, I, you know, I'm not a proper designer. I'm, you know, I, I've, I've made a career just out of, of, of doing things which I thought were interesting and, 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 and relevant and would be helpful 
and which I was had had the skills to be able to help with. So yeah, sorry, that's probably not a very good answer, is it? But anyway. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think I, it's interesting. I think there's really a common thread among all of us here, and that is this openness to experience and opportunities, and not necessarily pigeonholing yourself as I, I don't know what you all study or what you're looking to do in your careers, but you know, if you're of the type you say, I have to do exactly this, that way of thought might shut you off to other possibilities, other opportunities, other avenues of progression. And so, you know, I never said you know, when I was in college saying oh, you know, I'm going to go lead communications at a think tank. Like that's, that was not at all something I had planned, but it just happened to, because of the choices that I made and the experiences that I got, it just kind of led to it naturally. And so I, I began my career as a journalist. And, so, and the way I thought about communications is, it, it, communications is about good storytelling and being able to weave good narratives, compelling narratives that engage and command people's attention. That's how I think about things. That's how I structure my philosophy. Turns out that that philosophy could, or was applicable to other industries entirely. Like I wasn't gonna be uh, a journalist for the rest of my life because it doesn't pay much. Uh, but um, you know, that those skills were very translatable. You know, if I wanted to go into sales, a lot of what you learn as a journalist being able to track down leads, be fearless about talking to people, uh, you know, a lot of that is translatable to sales, but it's all about skills, right? That's the common thing here is that being able to learn not only uh, hard skills, but soft skills. And don't discount the soft skills because had I, one thing that has come with experience over the past eight years is empathy and understanding how these institutions work, because when I came in in 2012, I was a hard charging, you know, mid early 20s. I was like, everybody's stupid. They don't know what they're doing. They're all a bunch of boomers, this and that. And, you know, it, it's not like a single battle or anything like that. It, it, you, you, it's a war that you're fighting and you're constantly fighting it. And you just, you push the dial slightly. You just push it every day and make sure that you're, you know, for me, I was digital first talking about like, let's move away from print. Let's move away from hundred page PDFs. You know, at first a lot of resistance, but eight years later, we've had a lot of success and a lot of transition and a lot of cultural transition with CSIS. Thank you. And, and, and I appreciate actually that comment about empathy. Uh, one of the things that, that I do share with, with our students and, 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 and the like are be, be kind to us. Be kind to us who are not digital natives. Be kind to the digital adopters. Uh, and, and the idea that there is a generation uh, that lives within that digital sphere that doesn't know a universe without that digital component, when you match it up to those individuals who don't have that, like we, we didn't grow up in that digital sphere. We had to adopt it in order to survive, in order to be successful, in order to thrive you know, personally and professionally. And I, and I do think that, that it's, it's important to recognize that sometimes in the workplace, you will be matched up with individuals who come at it from a different lens, either because they grew up in an environment where it the technology and, and that digital sphere and that digital universe was not available to them because they grew up in a part of the world where that just wasn't there. The infrastructure wasn't there. The government perhaps did not allow for access to a certain online universe. And so there are individuals who have come at it after the fact because now they live in a place or they work in a place where that's a little bit more allowable. And the individuals who, again, have just evolved with age into a universe that has this um, digital language baked in versus those who have just grown up in it and it's second nature. And so when you mix all these folks together in a work environment, there, there is absolutely the opportunity for some tension, for some frustration, but there's also opportunity for education and for growth and for bridge building. And so, and it's not just, and it's not just for 
the digital natives to be patient and, and kind to the digital adopters. It's the reverse too, because I think that it can be very easy for, uh, and sometimes you find it more in that management level, it tend to be older individuals who will roll their eyes and say, yeah, yeah, we're not gonna do that. That's just silly. That, that'll come and go in a matter of minutes. I'm just not even gonna waste my time with it. When you have somebody who's coming at it with very good intention, very good data, very good, uh, results associated with it and are trying to go ahead and um, and move the agenda forward. So from that perspective, I think the, the empathy is important across the board. So, um, you know, we've gotten some great insight from our panelists. I think it would be a wonderful opportunity if there are some questions from our students. I don't know if it's easier for you to type it into the chat or do the little hand raise and then unmute your mic. But we have time for a couple of questions. I saw Eric pop back in, so I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of time. I'm not sure what the hard stop is, but um, I, I wanna make sure that our students do get the opportunity to ask some questions if there are some out there. And, and on our end, we're fairly flexible with time. If any of the panelists have to go a hard stop at an hour, you know, obviously uh, they can do so, but uh, our next session is a little late and we have a lunch break. So for those who can stay on, uh, you know, we're a little flexible. I do see some uh, hand raises uh, up there, so I guess we did ask them to use that feature. How we're gonna pick these hands, I leave to you, uh, Professor Izquierdo. I don't see the hands. The hands, okay. Uh, maybe uh, make you, uh, I can, I'll call on people and I might have to make oh. a moderator co-host, but uh, the first one that shows up on mine is Sebastian, so I'll start there. Good morning. Hi everyone, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, one of the themes that you guys touched uh, upon a lot was this kind of um, difficulty in, in finding out what the next big thing is in terms of communication. Uh, you know, this very sudden change, in, you know, Instagram comes out of nowhere, Twitter comes out of nowhere, or, or if they're there, you know, they kind of, uh, they gain this kind of officialness very quickly. So my question is, um, within your perspective, think tanks or think tech adjacent organizations. Uh, what do you perceive as being that next big thing, the, the next step in communications? And if you don't know what that is, what are the steps that you guys are taking to kind of research that and figure that out? And, and, and what's the culture like in terms of finding out what the next step is in communications? Can I give an answer to that little one? Yeah, please answer. Okay, Thank you. okay cool. So um, as I said, um, we're really interested in, in, in voice at the moment, um, uh, voice, voice search, and, um, but, but that's pr principally because it makes all search um, better. So that's, that's, that's a, an important one um, for us. We've, seen, we've started seeing clients use TikTok um, with various degrees of success um you know it's it's an, it, it's very experimental for think tanks at the moment we kind of like it i mean it's fun you know to do things like that i think that um a sort of more serious answer to your question is that um think tanks have been thinking a lot about public engagement um you know over over the last well for, forever but, but particularly over the last few years and frequently that has focused on communications in the sense of broadcasting to to public and, and, and trying to to cut through but actually public engagement in the sense of working with the public to create policy solutions or or publics or localities or communities to create public to to, um, to co-create policy solutions uh, I think is going to be a, an enormous thing and I think for us uh, working in, in comms it's how we go out and reach those people um, find those people and then conduct that research with them. So working hand in hand to actually um, with researchers to conduct those things in, in smaller localities, I think is actually going to be um, a, a big thing because if you, if, you, if you create policy in that way, it will resonate better with people or, almost automatically and it will be easier to communicate. Thank you. Not every panelist probably has to answer every uh, student question, though anyone who wants to make sure they say something, just make sure we know. But um, I can move on to another question unless one of the other panelists wanted to address that specifically. 
I, I'll just jump in and say I, I totally agree with John. I think that kind of communication is more of a feedback loop rather than just a push exercise. Um, I'm actually going to I'll throw a link in the chat here, which I think is really helpful. Um, a colleague of ours who works for an organization that does research in Tanzania and is also part of the Open Government Partnership was looking at sort of some creative, actually low tech ways to do this. But I think that especially with how the world is changing, there's going to be more of a need to kind of ensure that we're finding ways to kind of close that that cycle where it's not just think tanks pushing out communications, but the kind of closing the feedback loop. Thanks, Courtney. So I'm monitoring chat questions as well, so people can put them in there, and I'll make sure things some things I brought up. I'm going to go ahead. I see also a hand while I read some of these chat questions from uh, Mariana. Um, just if you're interested, if people are interested in this public engagement factor, you should also check out the uh, work of Celia, Cecilia Munoz at New America. She does amazing work in this um, in this area. Thanks, John. I will thank you so much uh, for letting me ask the question. Um, it's been really interesting to see how um, technological advancements have been a significant role um, in within think tanks and organizations. So I was wondering what were some of the difficulties in the process of modernizing um, your the think tank organizations, organizations in general, and how did you overcome those potential obstacles that were that were found? I, I can take this one. Um, so coming in, so I've been at CSIS for about eight years, and when I came in, people thought that putting a video file into a PowerPoint counted as multimedia, and that's not at all what we do now for the most part. Um, I, I mean, I would say I, there are very specific instances where like people push back on things, resist things, push for products that didn't make sense. But I, I mean, I think the biggest challenge is the cultural shift in think tank world, um, because despite all of us agreeing about where communications need to go, there are, don't underestimate the amount of people in this industry who still think that writing PDFs and reports is still a viable way forward. Um, so it's really making sure that we're connecting with these folks and making and and showing them the options and showing them the impact of uh, broader uh, digital outreach efforts. But I would say, I mean, culturally in think tank world, they they kind of tend to lag behind, you know, the very cutting leading edge of things in terms of like if you were a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, you know, think tank world is is far, far, far back, but put academia in that bucket too. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's really just convincing the non-believers that this is the way. I see. I, I, oh, I just, I just had a, another comment on that. Um, so I, I've been at the Wilson Center for a very long time. And as such, I've been through many website redesigns of wilsoncenter.org. And, um, you know, working with the, the directors, you know, we're, we're organized by program, right? So we, we cover every region of the world in a number of topical areas and each of those programs has a director and program associates, et cetera. So during the redesign process, you know, you're gonna get a better product if you're engaging your, the content creators. And so all along the way, you know, with every redesign I've done, I've made sure to include them and you know, I can tell you that the whole process from when I started at the center to now has gotten infinitely smoother because people now aren't pushing back against uh, you know, digital communications and getting away from the PDF and um, you know, just doing things differently. They're, they're much, you know, because all my program assistants now are digital natives, they're enthusiastic, they have great ideas, they're, um, they're much more engaged and embracing. So it's just been interesting from that point of view to see how we've all come a long way in embracing you know, the, the digital first model. Um, and you know, it's made my life a lot, a lot easier. Thank you, Lauren. I'm seeing some great questions that can be combined in the chat. Uh, so I first, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Jennifer to ask her question. Uh, via video, and then I see two other groups of questions I want to kind of combine uh, after that. So Jennifer, do you want to ask that great question you just put in the chat? 
Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Jennifer Puentes. I am doing a master's in international intercultural education. Um, so my question was, uh, what do you think for think tanks in places uh, like Latin America? As a matter of fact, I'm in Colombia right now, and I see the excessive amount of propaganda coming mainly through WhatsApp, um, what happens to spread throughout very much um, the general population. What we recommend for think tanks here uh, to use or the way to communicate with the general public uh, so that, you know, true facts and, you know, general information is being spread out and that people in place in Latin America are able to discern better. So I, I can jump in on this one. Um, uh, we've I, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of really fantastic think tanks in Latin America, and and I will say um, my experience have been has been that Latin American think tanks are some of the most sophisticated on a lot of these issues, especially around communications. You know, this is so we have these kind of three principles that aren't about specific methods or approaches or channels related to think tank communications, but I think they're really important. And the first one I think is especially relevant here, which is whatever sort of flashy kind of communications techniques you use or approaches or channels, the biggest thing that think tanks need to do is to stay true to the evidence. Um, there is this 2018 study that came out of MIT um, that was looking at the difference between false information and true information on Twitter. And what they found through really interesting methods was that a false story, story on Twitter reaches 1,500 people six times quicker than the average true story does. So that's, that's terrifying. <laughs> and it's terrifying if you're trying to get your research out. But I think that what we've seen sometimes is that organizations will kind of try to or, or feel a pressure to change the story change the tagline, you know, make it um, more kind of clickbaity. And the biggest thing that we, you know, say to organizations is that um, you really have to stay true to the evidence that you've revealed. And while it takes longer to get out there and it's harder to push out and, you know, there will always be some pushback, it's th the biggest thing that think tanks have is their reputation and their research reputation. And if you kind of shift to, to, um, try to make a story more clickable. I mean, there's things you can do, there's tricks, but really just ensuring that they're staying true to the evidence. Yeah, I would just, I would just add on, on that with um, think tanks in, in Latin America and, and, and elsewhere. It's know, know what your role is as a think tank, um, and that's to be true to, true to the evidence and to stick to the evidence. And, and it's, it's great if advocacy organizations take that evidence and use it to to do campaigns, um, but it's not necessarily your role as a think tank to do those campaigns for them, because in doing that, you will potentially lose some of your credibility. So you won't get as many clicks, but be be comfortable with that. Um, and then the other thing, I, I guess, just to just to say in, in in answer to people, some people who can answer your question better than me, um, if you get in touch with the people on think tanks, they're based in in Peru. Um, so they will know a lot better than, this, than me about this. Southernvoice.org is a network of think tanks um, that uh, operates in uh, Latin America, but also in Asia and Africa. Uh, so they know they have a lot of um, answers to these to these kind of questions as well. So uh, and then if you know if you want um, if you want an agency like ours, but um, but in Latin America, Socio Publico. Um, based in Buenos Aires, are an absolutely brilliant data visualization agency who do the same things that I do, um, but but better uh, <laughs> and cheaper. I think there, there's a lot of good questions in the chat here. They're kind of getting at different angles of who a think tank is communicating to. So I'm going to take my best stab at trying to kind of combine some of these thoughts for the panel's response because there's some very great questions and I'm so so proud of these questions coming in. So I see here that you know Clarissa is bringing up there, a lot of what we've talked about is digital forms of communications, but uh, amid the pandemic and otherwise, there are refugees and homeless individuals who, who don't have the access to this information in time because of that access to technology. So she's asking uh, what, if anything, is being done or could be done for those types of populations. I'm going to extend that question uh, by, by saying, uh, anything you all want to share about who the who think tanks are communicating 
uh, too. So would, would these populations be individuals that you are trying to communicate with? And um, I think that relates to Rose's question who came in right beforehand, but Rose is asking how much is audience considered? So going to uh, policymakers uh, versus the, the general, general public. And even Max here is bringing up the current infodemic about misinformation about the, the pandemic uh, specifically and whether think tanks have a responsibility to counter false narratives or simply to put out their own research. And I think that also gets to the question of the role of think tanks in communicating to the general public as opposed to, you know, maybe a policymaker or, or um, uh, a professional audience. So, so who's the audience and how do you counter the audiences, but kind of with a specific focus on uh, would uh, those who lack digital access like uh, refugees and the homeless uh, be targeted and and would would you be looking at countering false narratives coming out of other sources to inform the general public including how they should act in this public health crisis that's to any or all of our panelists uh, I, I can say something on this I, I mean primarily our audience is policymakers so people on the hill people in government um, people who are in professional diplomatic corps and, and, and that sort of thing. So we don't really, our role isn't, you know, public audience is important, but it's not our primary audience. And for us, that kind of filters down through hopefully the decisions that are made by policymakers and the interviews that we do on media and, and other channels. But we're not, like our research isn't designed to be like, okay, we're warning, you know, the average person, this is what they need to do during the pandemic. I mean, our analysis indirectly benefits people, but I, I wouldn't say that our main mission is to directly reach out. Though our channels do have that reach if people are interested, but for the most part, you know, we're, we're going after that, that quality of audience, not necessarily quantity first. Uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about this. Two things come to mind. Um, one is at the Wilson Center, there definitely is kind of a public education element to our mission. Um, and the way we live that out is all of our events are open to the public and we have at least a few every single day. So we are um, bringing in, you know, people from all walks of life come to the center to learn about the world we live in. Um, we also have a fairly um, robust kind of um, outreach, public education outreach program with local high schools and universities and civic organizations. You know, that we often have student groups come in and get lectures from, from our experts on certain topical areas. Um, as Paul mentioned, one of our kind of our main audiences are, are members of Congress and congressional staffers. And one, what I think is a really innovative program that's a little bit different um, at the Wilson Center and is, is actually very low tech, um, it, it's, it's human. Um, it's, um, we have a foreign policy fellowship program um, with uh, congressional staffers where it's a, a competition and um, congressional staffers um, apply to come to the Wilson Center for this fellowship where basically they're coming every Friday for a, a day long um, seminars with regional experts and experts on all kinds of different topics. And, you know, we ensure that both parties are equally represented, um, both genders are equally represented. And this program has been wildly successful because these congressional staffers are coming together and they say that they're really talking to their, you know, their, the other party, their counterpart, you know, and the other party for the first time. It, it's a place where they're coming and they're discussing foreign policy issues. Um, they're working on problems. Um, it's a very interactive, you know, day-long session. And we like to think that better relationships um, from both sides of the aisle are forming because of this. You know, they're listening to each other, understanding the other side's point of view and working together on, you know, discrete kind of public policy problems, you know, that we kind of, it's a very, you know, engaging kind of hands-on workshops. Um, so that's a low tech way um, of, of getting, you know, kind of fulfilling our mission. Um, 
but it's it's been really successful. One other small thing just to jump in on, I know someone asked specifically about refugees and I think there's definitely a challenge with doing uh, research communications to populations that don't have access to the same sort of, you know, technology and, and things like that. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier how we're seeing more and more low and middle income think tanks working in networks with CSOs, with grassroots advocacy organizations, things like that. And that can actually be a really powerful way for a think tank who, whose really primary audience is policymakers. And I think that is pretty consistent across the board, but where they have research that, you know, is it's not really their job to translate it to a more general audience or, or an audience that may not be as um, uh, doesn't have that same sort of vocabulary around research terms and things like that. But if, if a think tank has relationships with, say, organizations like an Oxfam or, you know, organizations that are working with um, issues like refugee camps, like LGBTQ issues, like um, uh, working with people with disabilities, there's there's kind of, they can work kind of with intermediaries to get that research out. And I think that can be really, really powerful. And then it doesn't fall on the think tank to have to take on this job of translating research in a way that, that may not be totally aligned with their mission. Great, thank you all. And I also wanna thank the students, not only for their questions, but for allowing me to do some of this question combination. I, it's really important to me that they get some face time. And, and I also, this is an efficient way of doing this, but uh, just all of you know, these amazing questions are coming from our RFIU students. And I'm seeing a lot of questions here since we're talking about policymakers as the audience, about how policymakers are using uh, this information. So for example, Alex asked about, are decision makers using this new media? Um, or are they resisting it? Uh, Noah asked about cases where uh, uh, government officials have used or ignored information that came uh, from a think tank. So I'd like to take that uh, line about the use of this information by policymakers, especially new media. I wanna specifically ask Paul because Paul is a friend of FIU's and has, has talked to, to many students before of which we appreciate. And we know that some of his uh, GIS and mapping and, and interactive uh, did satellite uh, work has caught the attention of the government and has ended up being tweeted about by government officials before and we'd love for him to tell that uh, uh, that situation but then open it up to the other panelists as well for their thoughts on that and Brianna asked if this is all a fad and Rosa asked uh, what older methods of communication need to be re retained so um, how are policymakers themselves using this digital information and is any of it uh, examples that are going to be a passing pad or, or older methods that are useful. But Paul, would you uh, start us off with some of your mapping work and, and how that has been talked about? Yeah, Even yeah, so official. this is a fun story because back in 2015, um, a lot of people didn't know about this. And this is where, and this is actually a good next question to talk about because the public does have a role to play and influencing public discussion is actually another way of like, forcing the discussion a certain way and informing policymakers, because if everybody's talking about it and everybody's bringing it up in their constituencies, then it becomes more of an important issue. But in 2015, uh, one of the things that we did was to publicly disclose uh, satellite imagery of um, secret, well, not so secret, uh, Chinese bases that were being built in the South China Sea on coral reefs. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, this is they they took out giant tankers into the middle of the ocean. They dredged up a bunch of sand onto these coral reefs, completely destroyed them, paved them over with you know runways, military installations, uh, surface-to-air missiles, and other kinds of military equipment. And then they said, because they occupy this piece of land that they built, they have nautical control of all the resources and dominion of the waters around it. And so this became a big issue because, of course, the governments knew about this. They had their satellites going over and taking pictures of this construction, but the public didn't really know about it. And for us, we said to a commercial satellite company, Maxar Technologies, we knew where they were. We had the locations. We just said, okay, just send the satellite over there, take a few pictures of it. And they did. And we built a website entirely around the satellite imagery that we put together. Um, 
And this blew up in the public eye. Uh, and this forced kind of uh, President Obama at the time to publicly reckon with this issue with uh, Premier Jinping at, uh, at one of the Southeast Asia summits. Um, it was all over the news. All the newspapers ran with the imagery that we got. One of the funniest stories I'd like to tell about this episode was that um, Admiral Harry Harris, who was the commander of PACOM at the time, um, of course, he had access to this, these images, but he could never show it in a congressional briefing. And the reason for that was, was because of government classification rules. So when he had to do a briefing to the Hill about this to congressmen and women, uh, he said to us, he's like, well, can you give me one of those images, but uh, make it printable? And so that's exactly what we did. We had an annotated image of one of these bases. It was called Fiery Cross Reef. We said, well, there's the barracks, there's the helipad, there's the runway. And we got it printed for him. It was like a six by four poster. And there's this really famous photograph of, uh, that the AP took of him pointing to it and then giving this briefing to Congress people. And I guarantee you that because he had access to this imagery, because people could viscerally see what was happening, the effectiveness of that briefing was exponentially so much better and so much more effective. Well, um, any other thoughts from the panel? And then I'm gonna, I see my, the last question I'm gonna bring up here on how policymakers are using or resisting the newer types of media uh, and, and what older types might be necessary to engage that audience. Great, so I see what um, I'm going to, um, bring in as, as I think probably our last question here, because it's something that I, I as I moderate these sort of things, I'm constantly trying to um, use the right lingo for, because on one hand, uh, many uh, think tanks are uh, in reality or describe themselves as objective, bipartisan, nonpartisan. For example, I also see on the landscape of think tanks that um, some of them have skewing towards one so, so sort of the other. And I once, uh, I'll say, made the mistake of uh, speaking to one of the think tanks we work with, mentioning, oh, well, I'd like to use you all as, a, as, a, as an example of a, of, a, of a partisan think tank. And, and they did not like that, that characterization, even though that think tank you know, does have quite an alignment. So the phrase that I've come up with personally, uh, I don't think it's a phrase used in the industry is kind of ideologically consistent. I see that some think tanks are ideologically consistent, even if they're not partisan and being affiliated with the, uh, the, uh, the, the a specific political party. So, so Jacob asked a, a question in here that, that inspired me to, to bring up my own question about how you all see this working with think tanks directly. And he said, uh, do, do think tanks have measures in place to ensure bipartisan objectivity uh, or does that come naturally? And so, you know, I would extend that to say, is it always a goal of any think tank to be be, uh, be bipartisan and objective, or does that vary by think tank to think tank? And uh, he also asked, and this might be good for Paul too, is it difficult to come from a journalism background where there's uh, more objectivity and then have to communicate on behalf of a think tank? Are, 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 are think tanks nonpartisan in the first place? And so what does that look like? Um, I can give an answer. I'll give an answer from a UK perspective on this, and, and someone else can come in on the on the US perspective. Uh, first of all, bipartisanship and objectivity are not synonymous with each other. Probably worth saying. Um, uh, second, second of all, a lot of think tanks, certainly in this country, will describe themselves as um, independent because the 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 public body called the Charities Commission in this country, which is the thing that allows them to get. Uh, charitable status and therefore for people to get tax breaks on the money that they donate to them uh, requires them to be uh, non-partisan and independent. So the one that I used to work for, IPPR, was very, very strongly affiliated uh, with the uh, the Labour Party in the U in, in in the UK, but it was it was an independent uh, think tank, um, and that was for charitable purposes. And occasionally we had to ask right wing people to come and speak to us at events so that we could pretend that we were independent. Um, all of this is off the record, of course. Um, uh, but there are occasionally, you know, there, there, are, there are examples of partisan think tanks in the UK, but they do not have the charitable status. So the Fabian Society, which is one of the oldest think tanks in the world, is, um, is literally affiliated with the Labour Party, is part of the Labour Party. Um, so, uh, 
you know, I, I would, I guess I would say that the more, the more successful think tanks, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, have, have an element of independence to them um, because they do need to keep going through changes of government. Um, so certainly when I worked for IPPR, um, you know, when we changed in 2010, when the Conservative government was elected, uh, IPPR's, you know, uh, the number of people that work for IPPR sort of halved, like practically overnight. Um, so independence, in the sense of if you can be an independent like Chatham House or someone like that, is, 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 a, is, is a better financial position to be in, I would say. Good point, which brings up a whole other uh, our uh, seminar in the future on, on, on think tank funding and, and uh, the backers and supporters of think tanks. So, yeah, and just to mention internationally, um, and this is, I think, a good thing to keep in mind, there's a lot of organizations that call themselves think tanks that are actually research institutes for the government. So my, my other sort of work life is around accountability in civic space. And so we do a lot of work in kind of closing civic spaces, authoritarian regimes. Um, you'll see a lot of really good and interesting research that sounds really you know, impressive and high quality that comes out of countries. And as you start digging into funding and things like that, you realize that it's a think tank that's calling itself a think tank, but it's actually an arm of the government. So yeah, definitely not all think tanks are created equal in terms of uh, bipartisanship or, or uh, independence. And, 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 uh, and little think, tank, think tanks pop up all the, all the time that are completely, you know, we have one, you know, um, in, in this, uh, we have a migration one in this country and there's a, there's a sort of climate change denial one uh, here in the UK as well. These kind of things that call themselves think tanks and then manage to get themselves onto the media um, described as a think tank um, are, are an annoyance to, to the degree that when I first started working with Chatham House, and Chatham House is a proper, serious, independent, big think tank, they would not describe themselves as a think tank. You know, that in, in their communications, they said to me, John, you must not describe us as a, th as a think tank. We are a policy research institute because the label at that time had become so kind of uh, tainted in their eyes by um, media putting people on from these uh, highly um, interest group oriented think tanks. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen the, uh, at the gray areas of that label, you know, here to some, we uh, speak on behalf of them, but also we took some students at Aspen Institute recently, which, you know, I think many would describe, and they, they even said that they, you know, are sometimes described as a think tank and even internally, they see themselves saying it, but they don't like that branding. They don't want to say that. So there's a decision among the organizations as to whether they're going to go after that label or not. And then external factors as to whether the broader community thinks an organization falls into that label or not. Um, I want to, uh, because I kind of inadvertently ended up uh, taking over the moderation of questions as, you know, this is the very first content session of the very first ever virtual flying. And we're figuring out how to best handle hand raises and chat questions. and and everything. So uh, I want to make sure that our, our, our true moderator, uh, Professor Arlene Esquierdo, has a chance to, if there was anything on her mind that she wanted to share, anything else that she wanted to ask to come back in and, and, and close out and uh, make sure that our panelists are uh, thanked as well for their participation. Well, thank you. And, and I appreciate you, you managing the, the housekeeping on that. Now I see the little hands, but before it was... Yeah, I made you a co-host. <laughs> But no, and I, I appreciate everybody's time um, and engagement. I, I think it's been a very um, interesting discussion. I'm hoping uh, our students have walked away with perhaps some insight that they didn't have when they first logged on this morning. And for it, Lauren and Courtney and John and Paul, really uh, impressive uh, backgrounds and information. I, I certainly appreciate you having taken the time out of your schedules to have joined us today. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with all of you in the future. Awesome. Yes, I, I echo those thank yous to, to our panelists and, and to you, Professor Izquierdo. I know uh, for our group and uh, our panelists are welcome to be on for another minute or two if they want or, or log out if they need. I know Carlos wanted to share with our group uh, the kind of historic information about uh, what's going on at the Supreme Court this month uh, that you can engage with while you're on this flying. Carlos, are you still around? 
Carlos is still around. And thank you once again also to the, to, uh, the panelists and Eileen. Um, in particular, just another plug, uh, the College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts is one of FIU and DC's partners and has helped and continually uh, helps place students at many of these uh, organizations, in particular CSIS and, and the Wilson Center. Thank you so much for being a, a constant host to our student talent. Uh, another first uh, here in DC uh, as of Monday and for the next two weeks, uh, the first time ever that uh, the Supreme Court is actually hearing oral arguments via telephone, not Zoom. Uh, and actually, I'm going to post the link so that uh, those that are inclined, and I know we have some uh, uh, future law students, can actually uh, tune in. So that's kind of exciting, and you can hear their uh, dialogue. So thank you, Eric, and um, thank you to all. Yes, indeed. So for our, our participants, we'll see you uh, after lunch at two o'clock. Thank nice you. speaking with you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.